Hi there. In this video, I want to talk about principal component analysis. And more specifically, I want to talk about this one feature in the scikit-learn implementation of it that's a little bit unknown, perhaps. As a brief reminder, principal component analysis is this estimator where you can pass a number of components, typically it's two, and then this gives you a way to turn a very wide array that's going in into an array that's relatively thin. Now, the way PCA works internally is that we are going to be multiplying this wide matrix, so to say, with some sort of a transformation matrix. And if this wide array was, say, shape n by k, then this transformation matrix would be k by 2 in this particular case. But then multiplying with this matrix can result in this thin representation. And, and the whole point of principal component analysis is that uh, we have a system that can find us this matrix such that we don't lose too much information, but that we do have this somewhat compressed representation of the original data set. We lose some information, but we have this nice compact representation, which can be great for visualization as well as some other tasks as well. Now, I want to talk about this one feature of the scikit-learn implementation, and we're going to come back to this diagram in a bit. But at this point, I want to also maybe start showing some code. So let's give a quick demo of what PCA might be able to do. As a demo, I'm going to be uh, loading up the digits data set that comes with scikit-learn. This data set is sometimes also referred to as MNIST, and it basically just contains lots of these low-resolution hand-drawn digits. This, for example, is a three. Let's go for another one. There are lots of numbers inside of this data set similar to this, of all the numbers between zero and nine. But one observation here is that a single data point in this data set actually has a lot of values. So if I were just to zoom in on the data point that is being drawn over here, that would be data point 500. Well, then if we reshape it, then we see this plot over here. But this plot is a representation of these 64 numbers. These are the pixel values that you see, so to say. And the higher the number over here, the darker the color over there. But you could argue here that 64 numbers is a lot. And maybe we can do something with PCA to find clusters and reduce the number of uh, columns, so to say. And that is something that I'm doing in the code below over here. I am calling the PCA estimator. I'm telling it that I just want to have two components. And then I fit on the data. When this happens, I'm basically learning that mapping that I mentioned earlier that can take a 46-dimensional matrix that is quite wide. And this will then be turned in a, a two-dimensional matrix. That's what this fitting procedure is going to help me do. After that, I'm also able to transform the data so I can take the original data that I had and I can turn that into a two-dimensional representation, which is plotted below here. Here's the 2D chart. Every point on this 2D chart represents a drawn number. And what I've also done for this particular visualization is I have set the color of the dot to be equal to the label. That is to say, maybe there's a cluster of threes over here, and maybe there's a cluster of twos over here. But the color that we have here denotes the label that is attached. So what we're seeing here is actually pretty interesting. Because remember, this PCA over here, we're feeding it the data set that just contains pixel values. I'm not doing anything with the labels here, but PCA is able to summarize the data set in such a way that it does seem that the points kind of cluster nicely together nonetheless. And the way that these points are sort of clustering together also seems to correlate with the labels. And for predictive tasks, uh, that can also be a very convenient phenomenon. But now I want to talk about a fun feature of PCA that not a lot of people know about. So what we've been doing now is we've been taking our wide array and we've been turning that into a thin one. This one has 64 columns and this one only has two. The thin matrix is really convenient to do some plots with, but if we think about the implementation, we can actually do something different. XW denotes the wide array, and that's multiplied by some sort of a transformation matrix T, and that is going to give us our thin matrix. But here's kind of the fun thing. 
If you're well-versed with linear algebra, then you also know you can kind of do this the other way around. I could take my thin matrix, multiply that by the inverse of the transformation matrix, and that should give me the data back in the wide format. Now, one observation here, of course, is that we don't get exactly the same data back. I'm going to introduce some notation here. I put a hat on this matrix to indicate that it's an estimate. Maybe good to observe, at least theoretically, is that there is also a method for us to go back in the other direction. And before maybe discussing some of the use cases of this, I figured it would be good to maybe just show what this might be like as a demo first. So I'm in the same notebook now, but I've scrolled down quite a bit, and there's a big cell above with some Jupyter widgets. There's a link in the show notes if you want to see the code, but the main thing I want to do just for now is to show what happens if I were to move this puck in this widget. This puck is part of a two-dimensional slider, and something can happen when I move around. If I move it to the top right, you can see that there's an effect over here. You can also see that something happens when I move down. Effectively, this 2D slider allows me to grab a point from the two-dimensional space that the PCA outputs. And you might think, well, that's nice and interesting, but there's an extra thing that we can do now as well. And that is we can demonstrate what this point looks like when we transform the thin representation of the point back into a wide one. So let's now move the puck close to a cluster just to see what might happen. When I move it in this purple area down below here, I seem to get something that looks like a zero. And when I click around, I see different versions of a zero, but they do all seem to be like a zero. Another thing that's kind of interesting is I can also sort of move to the outside skirts of this cluster, kind of in a region where there's no data points. And you can also kind of see an interesting effect happen there. We kind of get a grayish shape over here that doesn't necessarily resemble any number. So that's pretty interesting, but let's explore some more. Maybe let's explore this yellow blob over here. Okay, so when I'm around this region, it seems that we get nines out. And when I move closer to the cluster up here, we sort of get closer and closer to a three. And it also kind of makes sense that the three values and the nine values are kind of close together. If I consider what a three kind of looks like, well, if you squint your eyes, you can kind of close the loop over here and it does start to look at a, like a nine. There's not a whole lot of pixels that need to change to go from a three to a nine. So it also makes sense that these two sort of regions of clusters are close together. So at this point you might wonder, well, how does this actually work and how might you be able to do something like this yourself? Well, let's have a quick look at a subset of the code. And the line that's going to be of interest to us is this one over here. You can see that I've got this PCA estimator that I started out with initially. But because this is trained, this estimator also has a inverse transform available. And that allows you to take the thin representation going in, and it allows you to get something out that's in the same space as the wide data set that this estimator was trained on. It's literally like taking the transform, but doing the inverse. It's going in the other direction. I hope that at this point you appreciate this demo and that having a 2D slider like this can really help with the interpretation because it allows you to maybe more freely explore this thin representation of these data points. But maybe one thing I wanna highlight now is also just give you a slightly different perspective on how you can think about PCA in the first place. So let's consider one more time what PCA is doing. We have 64 dimensions going in and PCA allows us to turn that into a two dimensional representation instead. When we do this, we do lose some information, that's definitely the case. But the benefit of this is that this is easy to plot. Internally, there's some sort of a transformation matrix that makes this possible. But if we take the inverse of that transformation matrix, we can also move this back the other way around. And when you look at it this way, there's actually a couple of interesting ways to start thinking about PCA. After all, what we're doing here is we have lots of information in this wide array that we're trying to squeeze into this two-dimensional representation. 
So maybe one way to think about what's happening here is that this is actually kind of like lossy compression. We are not going to have a perfect mapping from the original space to this new one, but we are able to compress the information down. It won't be perfect, but the hope is at least that if there are global clusters in this space, that those clusters will also remain in this space and that they can also remain when they're translated back. And that might help inspire another use case for this technique. Let's say I've got some sort of data point XI, some sort of array of numbers that's going into PCA. I compress it down, then I compress it back again. Then I get back some sort of a estimated XI again. And what I could do is I could say, well, what's the difference between what went in and what came out of this PCA transformation? You could argue that if the difference is relatively small, well, then it's a data point that can survive the compression. So that might imply that we're dealing with a somewhat common data point, or a data point that belongs to a strong cluster that also is still around afterwards. But what happens if this is big? Well, if this is big, that is to say much larger than some sort of threshold, then you could argue, well, then it's probably not part of a cluster, or maybe somewhat uncommon because it's not part of a cluster. And in turn, that might imply that you're dealing with an outlier. And what's interesting about this, or at least I like to think so, is that PCA, which is just meant to do dimensionality reduction, can be rethought to also be used as an underlying technique for outlier detection. Now, if you want to do this proper, there is lots of wiggle room to kind of get right. One thing is how many components do we have in the middle over here? There's also the matter of picking the right threshold. And that's not even mentioning the whole, well, when is something an outlier and when does that matter in practice aspect of it. But because we have an inverse transform available on this PCA, it is possible to actually build some algorithms that do exactly this. Now, if this sounds interesting, you may want to have a look at the user guide of this Python package called scikit-lego. Now, full disclaimer, it is a package that I've helped maintain over the last few years. But if you go to the outlier section of the documentation, you will actually see this technique explained, and you will also see a component a little bit down below here called a PCA outlier detection uh, estimator. There's a chart over here that demonstrates the way it works, but the whole idea behind this PCA outlier detection revolves around the inverse transform that PCA provides. Of course, remember that this is just a method to do outlier detection, but I do hope that you can at least appreciate that a very cool thing about the PCA implementation is that you can reuse it to also build other tools. And that is sometimes a forgotten aspect of many of these scikit-learn components. PCA cannot just do PCA, it can also do a lot of other things.